This week, I'm exploring Russia's hidden underground military history in Vladivostok. I can just imagine the dark deeds that would be done here. Oh God, something dropped on my head. <laughs> We go shopping in Myanmar. It's actually quite difficult to walk through here. So busy. And Simon Calder has tips on what to do if you're heading to Rome with toddlers in tow. Travel show with me, Carmen Roberts, coming to you this week from Russia. And a little later on in the program, I'll be going underground into the tunnels beneath the streets of Vladivostok. But first, we head to Myanmar, a country off limits for decades because of military rule. But now it's opening up and tourism is booming. We sent Rajan Datar on a trek off the beaten track to find out about a project aimed at helping local people benefit from the increase in the number of people now visiting their previously off-limits country. Dazzling pagodas and ancient temples, these are the iconic sites that are attracting more people than ever before to Myanmar. But I'm here to get away from the main tourist sites and see a way of life that's remained unchanged for centuries. I'm heading to Pindaya in the Danu zone of Shan State to follow one of a new series of trails that it's hoped will help kickstart tourism in the region. I've just arrived in Pindaya and it's market day and it's bustling, it's full of people selling their wares, loads of vegetables, loads of fruit meet the whole thing and if we go down this channel here we'll see what else we can find here it's actually quite difficult to walk through here so busy the market is the starting point for many of the new danu trails there's an incredible array of stuff on offer but the thought of actually trying to buy anything in the crowds of people is a little overwhelming do you know what? I can't work out who's selling and who's buying it. <laughs> Even though it's kind of like anarchy here, you don't feel any sense of danger. No one's trying to rip you off, no one's trying to steal anything. It's a nice atmosphere. It's really cool. Back into the throng. There are more than 20 different walking routes that have been mapped out through this region with different levels of distance and difficulty. Expert guide Doe joins me to lead the way. Tell me why that is good for the Danu people to have this trek. Um, for the Danu people, they will get extra money from tourism, like, uh, let me say about like a supply chain. So tourism create and many people they can get jobs. So like shopkeeper, hotel owner, maybe waiter. So maybe we can create more and more jobs. The trail network winds through villages that have rarely seen tourists. Yeah. Please take off shoes, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. This farming family produced bamboo hats as a sideline business. They can make up to 300 a week. And then put on the husk, and then use a scissor, cut. So they need 10 pieces to make one head. This is head for the man. Oh, hat for the man. This is head for the woman. Oh, OK, OK. Different. Oh, OK. Whoops, we got a bit far on the other side. Uh, not so sure now. Let me just get that exactly right. Are you laughing at me? <laughs> so okay. in here, mm -hmm. so we can make one size. Very, very nice. Wow. One size fits all. Let's see if it fits me, shall we? Can I try? 
Oh, don't yeah. sound really young, actually, you must have... <laughs> Free size. Exactly. She must have guessed the, the size of my head because it fits perfectly. So she said, so this is for you. Oh. Present. You can take it. I couldn't, I couldn't. Possibly, okay, I will then. Yeah. The rest of the hats are bound for the market. So what's the legend of the spider? So the spider captured the seven fairy girls. And last on our trek, this major site of pilgrimage. Statues of a huge spider and a prince sit at the bottom of these stairs. Figures from ancient legends. Look at this. Wow. It's like a... Wow. These caves are home to 9,000 Buddha statues, some dating back hundreds of years. They're all brought and donated by devotees, hoping for a blessing. It's just Buddha, Buddha's galore. <laughs> and they're made of what? What material underneath the gold? Uh, it's like a mortar, yeah. concrete. Concrete, I think, yeah. right. So by making a Buddha, uh, image. What do the people hope that happens in, in terms of Buddhism? Is it to give them a better life, afterlife? So this is like a good deed. Yeah, like merit making. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe so for the next existence, so mm. to get so a better place, you know, because of the belief that they want levels of beings, they want to be like an upper, upper, and then to nirvana yeah. in one day. In one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wow. And if Nirvana is not an option, I for one am happy after years of this country being in isolation to settle for a slice of this magnificent landscape and culture. And if you're thinking of visiting Myanmar in the near future, here are our list of some of the best things to see and do. The Shwedagon Pagoda has stood for two and a half thousand years, a tribute to Myanmar's Buddhist faith. Catch it at sunset to see it glow. At 42 square kilometers, Bagan is one of Asia's largest archaeological sites. Access was restricted under the military junta, so most tourists are still to discover its monasteries and temples. Nearby, Mount Popa is another, less visited holy spot. At over 700 metres, prepare yourself for a steep climb. Also watch out for these furry creatures. Thousands of macaque monkeys live on the mountain and some don't take kindly to visitors. Keep any foods you have sealed if you don't want them running off with your lunch. Next up, it's our thirsty explorer, Brad Cohen, who this week is off to Kosovo in search of some homemade rakia. So we embarked on a whirlwind trip to learn about this complicated land through the drink known as raki, or rakia. While language, culture, and religion may divide Kosovo and other former Yugoslavian countries, they all share a love for this ubiquitous fruit brandy. Everywhere we went, there was raki a judge's party, a lingerie shop, even a monastery. Monks living here produce wine from 14th century. Monks living here and produce raki. What makes it good? I'm giving from testing, you tell me what you think about okay. it. Okay. Come, please, please. For nearly 700 years, wine and raki have helped support the Serbian monks. In the mouth it has to be soft, but he has to be strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I imagine this can get you through a pretty rough Balkan winter. And nice Balkan summer. <laughs> As we toasted, I couldn't help but wonder how often a Serb and Albanian Kosovar actually share to drink these days. You guys seem pretty peaceful right now. So. No, I was always peaceful. I mean, we grew yeah. up in the same country. Shane's friend needed more Rocky for his bar. Let's go. <laughs> so we headed to his producer's house in Rahovic, a town renowned for its rich soil and production of Rocky and wine. Here we got a lesson in homemade distillation. Saqib greeted us in typical Kosovar fashion. 
with a warm handshake, something to drink, and far too much food, which was quite literally farm to table. <laughs> Two hours now of, of eating and drinking, homemade drink and food. Life is good. Saqib's story is common in the Balkans. During the Yugoslav wars throughout the 90s, jobs became scarce. But there was plenty of fruit, and people used it to turn centuries-old family traditions into a business. Supplying bars with homemade raki, that is tasty. That day, Saki was making plum rocky, and friends, neighbors, and the entire family rushed to help with the precision of a pit crew. At its best, rocky tastes anywhere between a tasty grappa or fine cognac, depending on aging and type of fruit. At its worst, rocky tastes more like embalming fluid. Really, uh, I think you could preserve bodies with it. Unfortunately, it's impossible to know before tasting. Stay with us, because later on in the program, I run into some unexpected visitors deep beneath the streets of Vladivostok. And our global guru, Simon Calder, is here with his advice on the best things to see and do in Lisbon. So don't go away. Welcome to the slice of the show that tackles your questions about getting the best out of travel. Coming up shortly, the ideal way to see Rome with toddlers and the challenges of rail travel in Laos. But first, there's been lots of interest in the first non-stop scheduled flights between Europe and Australia. From March 2018, you should be able to fly from London Heathrow to Perth in Western Australia in 17 hours, one of the world's very longest air routes. Tickets don't go on sale until April 2017, and we don't yet know how much the trip will cost. Next, Emma Fletcher tweeted a cheerful video message to BBC Travel Show asking... Hi, we're the Fletcher family in Chester. We're off to Rome for a week in the middle of January. I wonder if you've got any tips for us with toddlers. Thank you. First, visit Explorer, Il Museo dei Bambini, as it calls itself, full of fun, interactive exhibits for small children and free for the under fives. Next, there's the Villa Borghese Bioparco. Although Rome's zoo is modest, the reptile house is always fun and warm in January too. And for an ice cream at a price that won't send you into financial meltdown, Giolitti, an elegant institution at the heart of Rome and well worth the inevitable queue. Dr. J.S. Wag is heading to Europe from his home city of Mumbai. I'm traveling to Lisbon for a business meeting and I have a full day free. Can you suggest the best tour options to see Lisbon? Start in the elegant city centre known as Baixa, mostly built in the 18th century. Then explore the hills to the east with the original Moorish quarter of Alfama. From there, Tram 28 clanks its way westwards across the city and clambers up to the Chiado district, perched on a hill high above the noise and bustle of the centre. Along the way, you can barely move for eating and drinking opportunities, including my favourite coffee spot in Europe, the Café a Brasileira, a feast of mahogany and mirrors that's been serving sweet, strong coffee for almost a century. Finally, John Rose was in Cambodia last year and says... We met a couple who told us they'd travelled from the very north of Laos to the south by train. Have you any information regarding this, as we'd love to pursue it? John, the couple you met had perhaps been travelling too long. Unlike neighbouring Cambodia and Vietnam, Laos has just six kilometres of railway. The line runs from the Friendship Bridge over the mighty Mekong River, which marks the Thai border, to Tanaleng Station, 13 kilometres from the capital, Vientiane. A shuttle train meets the express from Bangkok to run across and into Laos, where you can get a visa on arrival. To reach the capital, you then have to take a bus or a taxi. Until the rail network expands, the ideal way to travel in Laos is by riverboat on the Mekong. Though go downstream 
from the fine city of Luang Pabang to Vientiane unless you've got plenty of time on your hands to travel against the current. Whether you're after a slow boat or a fast train, The Travel Show is here to help. So email your question to thetravelshow at bbc.com and I'll do my very best to find you an answer. From me, Simon Calder, The Global Guru, bye for now and see you next time. Vladivostok in Russia's Far East is home to over half a million people. And it's no stranger to traffic jams, partly because there's no subway system here. But what do lie beneath Vladivostok's hills are the remnants of what used to be one of the most powerful maritime fortresses in the world. Abandoned for decades, some areas are now open to tourists. Number one uh, fortification. This is Vladimir Kalinin. He's an author whose interest in Vladivostok's military past was sparked as a young boy growing up in this area. Uh, 1901, as you can see. Is this where you used to come as a child? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Today, Vladimir and I are exploring his childhood stomping ground, also known as Stronghold Number no. One. So those holes there would be yeah, where the, the guns. Yeah, the holes for quick firing guns. At the turn of the 20th century, Tsarist Russia went to war with Japan over who controlled Korea and Manchuria to the south and the waters surrounding them. Vladivostok was home to the Imperial Russian fleet, and that made it a potential target. Vladimir, why was Vladivostok such an important military point? Uh, Vladivostok was the only gate of Russia in the Pacific region and it was uh, the only good port on the Russian Pacific shore connected with Siberia and other Russia by Trans-Siberian Railway. Wow, I didn't expect the ceilings to be so high. Yeah, it, is, uh, it was proposed for shelter of peoples and not only for as excessive past. And that's why uh, it's, uh, the tunnel have a lot of space space for people. Although many parts of the fort were used during the Cold War, this particular stronghold was abandoned after World War II. It's safe to say it has seen better days. To be honest, I find this place quite creepy. Maybe I read too many crime novels, but I can just imagine the dark deeds that would be done here. Oh God, something dropped on my head. <laughs> and you know what? People are still allowed to come in here. There's no doors barricading people off. And you can see from the rubbish on the floor that people still use these shelters. Oh, that was gross, that thing that fell on my head. During the Soviet era, Vladivostok was closed from the outside world. It only opened to visitors in 1992. As the Cold War thawed, a new generation of enthusiasts got interested in the abandoned forts and sprawling underpasses, some of them with more Western influences. Я подумал, что есть его в Владивостоке, есть вот такое у нас. Вот. Но с тех пор все началось. Today Sasha takes tours around Fort Number no. Seven. In good condition, it's one of the easiest forts to visit. But although it's well looked after, it's still best to go with a guide. Лестница оригинальная, как есть, так и есть она. Свод туннеля имеет яйцеобразную форму. Такая форма легче переносит давление горного пруда. Fort No. 7 was completed in 1916, and it housed troops until 1923, when the city was demilitarized. During Soviet times, the fort was used as a political prison, after which it was deserted. But despite years of neglect, 
Sasha tells me the fort still has many of its original features. Alex, tell me where we're going. Значит, мы сейчас идем по подземному туннелю на глубине около 24 метров. Дальше у нас идет поворот налево. Поворот налево ведет в систему огромных туннельных казарм. Казармы могли вмещать в себя гарнизоны до 400 человек. Офицеры и солдаты. Прямо у нас идет еще карцерное помещение для военнопленных или для тех солдат, которые себя плохо ведут. Вот здесь у нас начинаются туннельные казармы. Перед нами туннельная казарма для офицерского гарнизона. Вместимостью 50 человек. Эта же казарма при необходимости превращалась в военный госпиталь на случай осады. Вот. И, в принципе, кабель... Fort number seven is used by locals and visitors who come here for guided tours and for leisure activities, such as skateboarding and laser tag. <laughs> There's a guy with a gun pointed at me, what am I meant to do? No, I'm not jumpy at all. <laughs> Although many of the military structures in Vladivostok are still derelict, it's great to see more people getting interested in them. Because whether it's history or a fantasy game that gets you here, these structures that once aimed to make Vladivostok impregnable deserve to be preserved. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. And don't forget, if you want to follow us on our travels in real time, you can sign up to our social media feeds where you can share your travel tales too. Coming up next week, we head to the US to go whale watching off the coast of New York. <laughs> There's a lot of excitement on the boat because someone's right. just... Well, there it is, is! Boom! Ah, it's a ah, 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 ah. And Addy sees how far he can get exploring a massive cave network in Oman. There's flights and flights of stairs. Even I'm not going to attempt to go up them. It'd probably be easier to get up to heaven than to get up that knot. That's on the show next week. But for now, from me, Carmen Roberts, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Russia, it's goodbye.